Hey everyone, welcome back to Clinical Physio with me, Khalid Maidan. So this video is all about why we test active range of movement. But just before we get into that, what is active range of movement testing? This is the situation where the therapist asks the patient to complete a particular movement independently, with no assistance from the therapist, the contralateral limb, or a supporting aid. So therefore, in answer to why we test active range of movement, this testing gives us the opportunity to analyze any specific movement of any joint with active muscle contraction included. Whilst any problems with the movement do not directly implicate a particular structure, it provides us with a baseline assessment measurement which other orthopedic tests, such as passive or resisted tests, can be compared to in order to create our clinical impression. For example, let's choose a specific movement, such as knee flexion, and test it actively. Let's think about what exactly we're testing. Well, the first thing that comes to mind is the muscles, which are controlling the movement, and the tendons, which are being loaded as a result. Ligaments, fascia, bursae, neural tissues may also be stressed or tension during this movement too. Finally, the joint itself will be articulated. With so many structures involved, this leads to a lack of specificity making it difficult for us to exactly diagnose which structure is at fault. However, we can compare this movement with our other orthopedic tests, as we said earlier, like passive range of movement testing or resisted tests, to gain more clarity. In addition, active range of movement tests can also be used as a screening process to best differentiate the affected structures between areas of close proximity. So for example, if you have a patient with cervical spine pain, Active range of movement testing of the shoulder can be used to effectively clear this area. If the shoulder movements are shown to be pain-free and normal in quality and range, then we effectively clear it as a part of our testing. So, what do we look for in active range of movement testing? Well, in particular, we are analysing three key things. P, Q and R. P for pain, Q for quality of movement, and R for range of movement. And you will see these things talked about throughout our active range of movement tests in the Clinical Physio Premium catalog. Let's start with pain. So why do we look for pain? We need to look for and reproduce pain to help us work out what is wrong with our patient. We are looking to see what pain the test elicits, where the pain was elicited, and also the severity and nature of the pain that was elicited. In terms of what and where, we may consider if we can relate that pain into the patient's previously reported symptoms, or whether the pain corresponds with a specific anatomical structure, for example, the biceps tendon, or along the sciatic nerve in the leg. In terms of severity, we may question if the pain elicited was just a mild pull, for example, or an extremely sharp sensation. The therapist could make a note of these things and compare them in future sessions. So let's go through examples to make sense of what we just said. Let's take our patient Roger, and Roger is complaining of sharp posterior left-sided buttock pain. When we test Roger's active left hip extension, a sharp pain is elicited at the posterolateral hip over the gluteus medius region. Now this could implicate the gluteus medius as the irritated structure, causing Roger's condition, which would also fit in with our subjective history, as the gluteus medius was the region in which Roger reported his pain when we asked him. This also confirms that active hip extension is an irritable movement for Roger. Now let's take the same example, but with a slight change. Let's suppose that when we tested Roger's active left hip extension, he found that he experienced an aching in his lower back. Whilst this may well tell us that the lumbar spine may be irritated for Roger, it does not implicate the gluteus medius in its active state as the source of our patient's pain during this specific test. And this is because even though Roger reported pain in the posterior hip in his subjective history, the pain elicited in his lower back during this test is in a different location and it's of a different nature and severity. 
This means that we don't currently have enough data to confirm that the gluteus medius is at fault, whereas in the previous example we did, because the gluteus medius contraction was painful at that exact point. Next, on to Q for quality of movement. Good quality shows no restriction to movement, good muscle activation, and a willingness to move. Therefore, if our patient has poor quality movement, this tells us that our patient could have a restriction to the movement, poor motor control, a fear or an apprehension towards said movement, or a limitation due to pain. Poor quality can be used as a useful outcome measure in itself, particularly when our patient demonstrates reduced control of the movement. For example, let's say our patient's arm judders as we are asking them to bring their arm down from a fully flexed position, it's good to make a note of this and compare it to next time. So now on to R for range of movement. So why do we actually want to test range of movement? Well, too much or too little range at a particular joint could indicate a dysfunction within the movement pattern, or a limitation in range could be due to a mechanical striction, such as a stiff joint capsule. Either way, as a therapist, it is always important for us to use the range values within our movement tests as objective markers, and for us to compare the specific range values from one treatment session to the next, so we can see if our patient has progressed or regressed, for example. It is also important to note the range at which our patient's pain starts, as well as the range at which the movement ends, as often these two values can be different. For example, if we only measured the movement at which our patient's pain started, we wouldn't actually know how much range they can achieve altogether. Let's go through a better example. Let's take our patient Tim, who is undergoing rehabilitation following a left distal radius fracture, and we are measuring his range of active wrist extension on his left side. We note that Tim complains of pain at approximately 10 degrees of wrist extension, which he rates as mild. With his consent, he agrees to take the movement further, as his pain is only mild, and we find that he can now achieve 40 degrees of active wrist extension. So for Tim, if we had actually stopped the movement at when his pain started, we would have thought that he may have only had 10 degrees, which would have been a marked deficit in his extension in comparison to last week's session, where we found he had 20 degrees. However, by measuring his total achievable range, and not just stopping at the point at which the pain started, we've now find that he has 40 degrees, and therefore he's actually progressed since last week. Another point to mention in regards to range of movement. Pain at certain ranges can be linked to specific pathologies. For example, a painful arc in the shoulder is used to describe a specific range of pain for shoulder abduction, typically between approximately 60 degrees and 120 degrees. If we find that our patient does have a painful arc during our testing, this could implicate a subacromial dysfunction. And therefore, this is an example of where certain ranges can be linked to specific pathologies. And that completes our video titled Why We Test Active Range of Movement. You may also want to check out our video titled Why We Test Passive Range of Movement to compare your movement testing options. Thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you again soon right here on Clinical Physio.